we were in negotiations for investing in real estate. They're winning, they're making money. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Real Estate Educators Podcast, where we provide education you could build on. I am your host, Kevin Amos. This podcast is unlike anything that I've seen or done before. We focus on real estate investors and the content creation behind that. We want to help real estate investors and content creators, real estate influencers make more money. If you like what you hear today, or even if you don't, please do me a favor and give me a five-star review. Maybe share it with a pal, a friend. Today is going to be a fantastic episode. Someone that I've known for several, several years, runs a fantastic organization here in Denver. Tim Emery, 19, that's the number. Yes, 19 years in the real estate industry. Pretty close to where I'm at. I've, I've got 20, so I got you by one there, Tim. Uh, eight of those years has been in real estate education through the Invest Success Company that we're going to talk quite a bit about today uh, on the episode. So, Tim, how's it going, man? It's great. Good to see you. Um, thanks for letting me be here and uh, get involved. And yeah, 19 years. It's, uh, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. but it goes like that, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, I remember it doing does. my first deal. It was... Uh, 20, 22 years ago. And then I moved out of it and kept it as a rental. So my first rental property was, was just over 20 years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's been a great roller coaster too. Up, well, let's down, go back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I want to talk to you about some of that because you've, you've seen and experienced more than most just because of what you do. I mean, you have students and so it's not just you out there looking at, you get to see through their lens also. So you have quite a bit more experience than just an, uh, you know, an ordinary real estate investor doing it for themselves. So I definitely want to dig into some stories here. But take me back 19 years. Like, What got you started? What got you even interested in real estate investing? I wish I'd tell you it was some epiphany sitting on some lake somewhere, but it really wasn't. It was, uh, I'd spent a bunch of years in uh, Vail Valley as a fly fishing guide ski instructor, and I'd grown up with a couple guys. Uh, one in particular since I was in kindergarten and his family had bought, started buying rentals in 1972. Um, you know, he was, his dad was a, you know, vice president of a big local bank here and they just, his family just started buying properties. And as we kind of grew up together, you know, back in the days when we didn't have cell phones and, and you know, other stuff, we had to actually go to our parents' jobs or, sit in the car or something and we'd go, you know, help paint, you know, rental properties and collect rents. And I, I don't know exactly what we were doing, but it felt like we were doing that. And, and his family would always have big, you know, coin bags in their front, you know, in their, uh, on their kitchen table because they were counting quarters from the laundry machines. So, you know, I had a chance to, try and grow up and I left the Vail Valley and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And my friend Lance said, Hey, why don't you come down and be a realtor? We just started a real estate company and said, okay. So I came down, started studying for my license and learned that uh, studying for your real estate license doesn't teach you much about anything, but learned a lot of good facts and went to work with these guys and, you know, started becoming a realtor in 2004 and hustled my butt off. I uh, learned how to cold call, um, which I don't like to do anymore. <laughs> learned scripts, which I'm not very good at it either. I figured that out, but just worked my tail off. And, you know, we were a, a young enough real estate company that we could kind of move and do whatever we wanted to do. And we weren't associated with a, a big national program or anything. So, you know, we kind of leaned into the rental part and the investment part and, at that time, everybody had a lot of money in their pockets and a lot of, you know, money in their equity in their house. So we were teaching people how to pull the equity out of their house, go buy more rental properties so they could retire sooner. And that's really what got me started, got me learning how to call properties and do fix and flips and uh, try and figure that whole business out. So, you know, that rich, that poor dad thing is really what got me going. My dad was a brilliant engineer uh, on the forefront of um, GIS technologies, but you know, he was way on the forefront. So he kind of missed the boat. So this is the way I learned. And now real estate's everything I do and talk about. 
Yeah, that's such a great story. And I, you've never shared that with me. Um, all the times we've hung out, we ne neither one of us has shared our, our story in this no. kind of detail. So Lance was, was he your buddy in, at this, at Vail, at the ski resort and fly fishing? And then, so this is a different, different buddy. No, different buddy. So kindergarten, we actually ended up going to a couple of years in college together. And then I took a path. I went up to Vail to be a ski bum. He, he stayed in college to be an exercise physiologist. And then 10 years later, we got back together as real estate agents. So um, <laughs> neither of us, we all took different paths to the same place, you know, started his company. It's still available. It's still alive called Sticks and Stones. Um, they do a lot of property management. And I returned to him in 2012, 11, 12, 13. We built a property management company together. And those are really where the stories come from. No, I've got yeah. stories from every aspect of it, but those are the fun stories. Yeah, and I want I want to get into that for <laughs> sure. But I'm trying to tie this together. So Lance is the guy you went to kindergarten with. Yep. You guys went seven directions. You guys came back together, and then you've been able to accomplish what you've accomplished since then. But your true rich dad was your buddy from Vail. It sounds like you were going oh, with no. his parents around. So Lance's parents were the rich dad. Okay. Okay. I missed yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. So that, so Lance's parents was the, was the rich dad. So they were the ones counting the quarters in the car from the, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah. 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 When I heard you saying that, I was like, man, that sounds an awful lot like that purple Bible we, we talk about. Right. So, oh, it, it is. I mean, uh, it, the purple Bible is exactly what happened to me. And, you know, that's why I tell that story because, you know, I got to live the other side and, you know, it's not easy though. It, it's been a roller coaster for sure trying to figure sure. that out uh -huh. so i want to get up to the invest success but before we do that let's let's go into the property management so you got into real estate with lance and you were doing the hustle mm -hmm. like we all do when we're getting started that's how we we're successful yep um but you were focused not just on real estate investors but you kind of started focusing more on that it sounds like as you progress through your career so do you know what turn your 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 shift in thinking from a regular home buyers let's just sling real estate to let's focus on investors do you remember that that switch there? Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of I am sick of of the roller coaster of being a realtor. Um and those of you who have been a realtor or a real estate agent, the, the hard part isn't finding the deals. It's not doing the projects and not doing the the contracts. It's actually going to find the next client. I mean, I'm out here marketing, I'm out here spending money, I'm running around and I want new business. But my business isn't going to repeat for seven to 10 years. So how do I change that? How do I go from spending, you know, two, three, four grand a month to get new buyers or sellers and change that? And when I, we when we figured out if we found the true uh, fix and flippers and investors, it could be somebody who's going to buy three to four houses for me every year or at least, you know, two houses a year. And how could I find 20 clients doing that? consistently and, and still to this day i practice and preach that to my new students and everybody who comes on that's a real estate agent i said stop throwing your money at farming stop throwing your money at you know doing all this stuff stop you know cold calling go find yourself five to ten investors who are going to build buy projects two to three times a year and you can make a really good living if you've got 10 people doing two two deals a year now that's 20 deals and if each each deal's worth you know, 10 grand, you're making 200K a year just from those people. So how do you do that? And that's the, you know, where it switched. And that, the problem was it's that switched in 2007. My brain oh. switched in 2007, right after, right as 2008, yeah. 9, 10 happened. And scrambling to find those buyers at that time was really hard. So that's kind of what threw me off for those few years with that because just couldn't find people to buy houses. So you have the exact mindset most successful people do have, which is the residual. You got to try to build residual. You need multiple streams of income. We always talk about that. But the way to turn it a transaction-based business, like selling real estate into a residual, and you were able to accomplish that by just finding more buyers that are going to repeat. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and you're, you were generous to say 20 deals because if you're a fix and flipper, your clients is fix and flipper, let's say, that's two transactions per deal, right? Assuming you're helping them locate the project. Right. Uh, you right. get two listings for sure, but possibly two buy side as well. So it could be as much as 40 
yep. transactions in a year with yep. only 10 clients. So yeah. Yeah. Um, now back to 2007, I remember this so clearly, Tim, I was pretty large portfolio at that time. I had over 50 doors and they're all single family and detached. So individual houses. And I remember the interest rates going up and I remember rent values coming down. And then we were all in adjustable rate loans back then. That's what they were selling. Right. And I remember I could still feel it as I talk about it right now, how painful that was. How, how was that for you when you were just getting into the investment side back then? Well, uh, it was, it was rough. I mean, trying to figure out what to do through that, you know, I had to take a side job and, you know, work with another entrepreneur type business and I couldn't go to work for somebody. Now that's, uh, that's the most painful thing I could ever think of. I mean, go work for somebody for 40 or 50 grand a year. And then I'm stuck in an office from 8 a.m. to 5. I can't go see my kids. I can't get out of the house. I can't go to doctor's appointments or anything like that. It doesn't, wasn't for me. So uh, really dealing with that was hard. Now, then we started creating our customers, right? And, you know, 2008, 9, 10 started turning around. And now we're starting to find people are like, oh, can I buy a deal now? And then you're showing them tons of deals and they don't want it. it, it yeah. They were all scared. Everyone was scared for 2009, 10, 11, that this was going to continue or something else was going to get worse. And we're like, you're buying this house for you for the long term. And that was, you know, it was just rough in those years. I had, I had two kids, my had one kid, 2008, one kid, 2009. They were toddlers. Yeah, and, they do. I, so we're in the same boat. Oh, God. And for those of you who forget, raising kids is damn hard. And it's not easy. And for those of you out there who think it is and keep trying to convince me it is, no, it's not easy raising kids. It gets harder every year. <laughs> the hardest thing you could do. I agree. Um, yeah, Maddie, my, my oldest was born in 2008. Yeah. Right when. And that's when I started Pine. So it was like all kinds of stuff going on in my world, but just like everybody else. And yeah. You know, interesting but when you're saying that 2009 and 10, um, I think those are the two years that, that stuck out what you said. And the, dude, those opportunities will never be here again. Um, we had super low interest rates because the, the government was trying to help. Right. And we had real estate at half off. You know, it's 50% off sticker price. Yeah. Um, so we were buying as much as we possibly could. And I bought quite a bit of properties for John, um, who you who you knew really well. Um, so John Fisher was an amazing, amazing person. And he started the, the breakfast club and it was pretty small when he was getting started. And I was going to that. Um, I did a lot of business with John and he had that breakfast club and now you're doing the breakfast club. So tell us a little bit about John Fisher and what he was accomplishing and what you're, uh, what you're accomplishing now. Yeah, of course. So John started this breakfast club in 2004 as a, you know, what more. So he, unfortunately he passed away in 2015. I've got to spend a lot of time with his widow, Lauren. Um, over the years and learn about what he was doing, trying to do. And, you know, he, he had spent two, I think he's in 98, 99, he had got a Ross Whitney uh, DVD and then he did a reset Ford ad or fortune builders. They'd spent like a hundred grand in mentorship and trying to learn how to do this. And I think 2004 was basically when he said, all right, I'm going to go do this. So he started building this breakfast club to try and help himself find business is, is really what he was doing. And he started out with four or five guys and they met every month, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Or actually, I think back then it was 6.30, 6 or 6.30 on a Saturday morning. I don't remember the time, but I remember being early and I remember it was at Perkins at the beginning. And... Yeah, yeah. And as he just, he just continued to grow and grow and grow and, and he did a, bunch of interesting things you know he's tried to do you know the thing coming out of 2004 5 6 7 was a lot of people were pooling money together to buy properties as well um and then 2006 and 7 people were still kind of trying to do that and some things kind of got a little upside down but the whole time he was doing that he was creating this education platform because he was an educator and he wanted to help and teach people uh and as he kind of developed you know he got involved with you guys and i know you guys did a lot he did a lot of wholesaling um he figured out how to use the hud home store and make uh figured out some um algorithm that allowed him to buy properties on the hud home store and be able to wholesale properties and so he was more of a wholesaler and 
did really well and you know his breakfast club grew and i found his breakfast club i think 2012 or 13 i haven't been able to calculate when i or even research when i did but i found it because i had just started this property management company and i didn't know where there were investors and i didn't know how to find them and somehow maybe it was meetup maybe it was it was some kind of flyer came through and I was like, oh, I got to go to this. And I went once, you know, freaking 7, 6.30 on a Saturday, freezing my tail off at, uh, I think, a hotel uh, off of Hamden. Just scared. like this. That wasn't the kid. New York Daily News, right? No, this was after the Daily News. After that, okay. It was the Embassy Suites right next door, actually. Got it, but, okay. So I went to that, and I went like three times in a row, and... On the third time, I sat next to this nice lady, and she looks at me. She goes, you're the property manager, right? I said, yeah. She goes, will you go manage properties in parts of town I don't want to go? I said, sure. <laughs> next thing I know, two years later, I have like eight properties of hers. She keeps buying more properties. And then I found a fiveplex. You know, I got a fiveplex off market that I took to her, and she bought it. And... You know, we managed all her properties and did great for the next, you know, 15 years or so. The Real Estate Educators Podcast is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial Group is a private lender specializing in value add bridge lending for real estate investors. This is accomplished by raising private money from individual investors and lending that money out in short term real estate loans. Pine operates one of the coolest public mortgage funds on the market because it brings consistency and security to your investment portfolio without giving up on returns. The fund pays its investors a flat 8% return with monthly distributions. There is a low minimum investment and no lockup period. That's right. You can request all of your money back at any time without any fees. Diversify your portfolio out of Wall Street and into Main Street with the Pine Financial Group Public Fund, PFG Fund 5. Find out more at pinefinancialgroup.com. That's pinefinancialgroup.com. And I definitely want to dig into this breakfast club because you and I have both done a lot of business from it. And the concept of how it was designed and how it de is delivered um, benefits everybody. It's And that's what John was so good at. His heart was so big. And did he want business out of it? Of, of course he did. And that's where he got started. But just the give value, give value mentality that he had um, benefited him hugely. And, I, and, and you now as well. So I do want to get into that. But I want to talk about the property management company before we get too far away from that. So you went to work with Lance. Mm -hmm. You guys did real estate. You left, it sounds like, came back and wanted to do the property management. And you guys did that together. So yeah. that's, the pro that's the property management your company you're talking about now that you got the... Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about how that got going and, and paint that picture for me. So, you know, I always held my license at, at Sticks and Stones as well. And I always kept an office there. So everything I did... 2007, 8, 9, and 10 was still part of that office. You know, in 2007, the office had got up to about 32-ish, 30 people, 30 agents. And then 2008, 9, it was just like, okay, what, they, what a small real estate, uh, real estate company understands is people are time and they take a lot of time. And it was a lot of coaching and a lot of a lot of dealing with people. So they kind of decided at 2078, okay, we got to let this go. We're just going to concentrate on our own stuff. And we ended up with, you know, three, four, four agents in the office just doing our own deal. So we were always there. We were always together. But what we noticed was 2009 and 10, nobody could sell their houses. We could not, we were putting listings up of great houses in good shape and they wouldn't sell. And these people are like, well, I got to move to Texas or I got to do this. And, and I really want to sell. And we're like, well, why don't we let us rent it? And you, you'll keep it for a few years. And, and right now your rents will break you even, but at least you're not losing anything. We'll, we'll go from there and then we can raise rents as hopefully things turn around. And people are like, okay, because, you know, to cover their mortgages at that time was almost impossible. 
because everybody had a second mortgage out on their house. I mean, even my, me and my wife, ex-wives, were, our mortgages were what we owed until 2013. I mean, we weren't losing money, but we weren't, we didn't have any equity in our houses. So once we started doing that, Lance and I decided to work together. He, he had about like six or seven properties he owned. He was managing a couple for friends. I was managing some for friends. I owned a couple and then said, you know what, let's just do this. And so we put it together and, I, you know, those early days, I did all the hard work out and about looking for properties, finding deals, finding people to rent, finding tenants, all that stuff. He did a lot of the back end stuff. You know, we got involved with the, you know, our lawyers set up all our contracts and our leases and everything. And we just built from there. And it was, it's an interesting business to build. And Kevin, you're probably, you probably know building your business the way you have, you always start getting big and you get really busy and you're like, okay, now I've got to expand. But the minute you expand, you've got to bring on more people. So you almost take three steps backwards, you know, to go to, you know, to go six steps forward. So we kept doing that. We, we, you know, there would be weeks I was working until 10 o'clock at night dealing with this stuff, just stressed out. And then all of a sudden we hired a gal and that all that stress went right off my shoulders. It, it was amazing. And then we got lucky because out of breakfast club, I sat down the same lady I sat down to at the, the story I told already. I sat down next to her at the next one and her friend was there and she said, I've got a son moving from California. He's 21 years old, really wants to get into the business. Can he come talk to you? Sure. He showed up. He chased me down at some event I was hosting. Talked to, I totally forgot who he was. Talked to me. He was like, I'll come work for free. <laughs> that's a that's go getter. So we brought him on board and you know, for we gave him a month and he was doing great. So then we went and found him a part-time job so he could work with us and make ends meet. And then, you know. I think a year later, we started paying him full time. Nice. And he's probably pretty darn successful right now, if I had to guess. Yeah, he's uh, had a couple hiccups, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, <it's> okay. <laughs> he, he was young. He was young. And, you know, I think he's doing good. I haven't seen him for a while, but he was definitely a go getter. We definitely taught him everything we knew. So, yeah, if you got that motivation, I'm sure you see this with your students. You can make a lot of mistakes and overcome that stuff mm -hmm. if you if you have the drive. So yep. hustle beats skill 10 out yep. of 10 times. I really believe that. It does. It does. But the the Breakfast Club is really kind of what catapulted that. And I would say, and John, you know, John was alive at the time. And John would call on me all the time and ask me questions about the market, what was going on. And that just led me to be that kind of expert in the room, which brought a lot of business to me. Um, and with the breakfast club, that's what I try and do with people. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Certain industries have this group of people that really want to work hard and really do their stuff and build their businesses. And then there are some parts of this industry that I can't pull teeth to come to a second time to an event. Yeah. It's amazing. It's so interesting you say that because there's sometimes you get that on the other side where they'll go to every event and never actually become a student or never do a deal or never borrow money or, or any of those. <laughs> you, have, you kind of have both there. Um, but I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong here, Tim, but the breakfast club that you're operating now and still structured the same, I think, where it really promotes networking and value. I assume you get students out of that, yes? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> yep. And I haven't, I, since the day I met John, I haven't changed the format what bit. Um, in the 20, or 19 years it's been going for the first time, we've changed a, a couple little things within the last two months. We made a, we got a ticket for everybody that they can buy for the year. So they don't have to buy a ticket every month. And then we bought everybody who's buying a year long ticket, coffee mugs. So they're going to have their own coffee mug at the event and their own name tag. And other than that, we're, it's status quo. It's the same. So if somebody came in 2007 and came back now, they'd be, they'd be pretty much the same. So let's, let me see if I can paint this picture for the audience here. The, the breakfast club is structured where there's no formal education. It's really about community. 
So people will come in. Everybody gets a chance. What is it? 30 seconds, one minute, something like that. To 30 seconds. Who I, who I am, why I'm here. And then after everyone's done, then it's just an open conversation with the room. And a lot of times when I was going, you went to the market, like, what are you guys seeing? What, what kind of deals are you seeing? What's working? What's not? So huge, huge value add to your, to your uh, guests. And I would assume not a ton of prep since there's no presentation or, or anything. So pretty, pretty cool structure that you guys have there and something that if I was in real estate as a, an educator for sure, but even as a realtor, I would consider creating a group like this. Um, so you get students out of it. Now let's talk yeah. about that. So invest success separate from the breakfast club, its own entity, helping people do what? So we're teaching people the basics of real estate through fix and flipping, fixing and flipping really because our belief is that if you learn how to fix and flip a house, if you go through the process, you will, at least through me and, and what we teach, you will learn everything you need to know that you can pretty much go do anything in real estate because you'll have gone through a process of how to find them. I mean, properties, they're out there, but they're not easy to find. And that doesn't matter if it's a, a single family fix and flip or a commercial or, you know, a storage unit, they're out there, but you got to know what you're looking for and how to find them. And then, you know, you got to know how to fund them. You got to know where to go, which lenders are reputable, which lenders will be there for you, which lenders aren't going to, you know, bait and switch you. You know, Pine is one of our go-tos. Uh, there are a couple others out there that are that are good that we like because we know the people because we have relationships with the people and and long term legacy, you know I, I think is key. And then we got to learn how to you know run the numbers. The numbers are, are a huge key to this business. And, and guys, I'd love to tell you the numbers are the hardest part. It's the easiest part. They're pretty basic. You have to find what they're worth. You have to find how much it's going to cost to fix. How much is your money going to cost? How much is it going to cost to sell? And then how much can it sell for or will it sell for? And then you got to learn how to work with the contractors. If you're going to get it fixed, contractors are one of the hardest parts of this business. And we don't just give you contractors because I don't believe that would do you any good. You got to learn how to build contracts, scope of works. You got to describe, you got to tell a freaking contractor that I want this thing blue or black because I want it like this and we've got to be on the same page. Okay. And then we've got to work with them during the whole flip. You know, how do you keep them motivated? How do you make sure that they're getting things done? They need to, what hiccups are you going to run into? I mean, you know, the, the, the hiccups you'll, you'll hit are huge. And we, we've been through those hiccups. You know, what happens when you, you get a roof permit, and you're not doing anything else into, on the interior, but you get a stop order because somebody said you were. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, the city and county? And, and that's a huge factor. And then, you know, how do you deal with it? So contractors are working their tails off, but all of a sudden you go there for three days in a row and they're not there. Well, why right. aren't they there? <laughs> well, either one, they're off on vacation, or number two, maybe they were letting the floors dry. And they couldn't get anybody in there. Or maybe they had something come up. But, you know, you got to learn how to deal with that stuff. Because if you don't, it'll drive you crazy. I mean, this is not HGTV, guys. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I tell people that all the time, Tim. The money, the the contractor thing, I, I, I made a little joke there. But gosh, what, when I was just getting started, um, I'm doing a fix and flip. And I gave, I gave a contractor some money to get started. You know, a lot of them want that up front. And I didn't know better. And so I gave him what he asked for. He, he went to Mexico. Yeah. He took his family on a trip. Yep. Never did get that money back. Yep. Yep. There's, there's lots of that stuff going on and you just gotta, you gotta have contracts and the scope of work is so important. Uh, and Kevin, I'm, I don't like getting in arguments or fights with people. I just am not that type of person. I get mad behind the scenes. Um, working on that problem with my therapist and stuff, but <laughs> I'll, I'll wait to get mad. But if I've got something in writing in black and white that just shows what we're expecting and I can just put point it out there, it's like, hey, here you go. And it's black and white and there's no arguing. It makes life so much easier. 
and, and takes the emotion out of this business. And, and that goes for coaching. I mean, my emotion, I have students, half my day is spent dealing with the emotionality of this business, the roller coasters. It's hard because it's a cycle. And, you know, as an educator, I see the cycle for my students. They're in my group. They're in my class for a year. Most of them have a little bit of experience, but not a ton. Um, some have a lot of experience, but the ones that are fairly new, there's an exact, there's a pretty good cycle that I can tell you in the first two months, you're going to be so overwhelmed with stuff. You won't even know what's happening. Month two to four, you'll start figuring it out and you'll be like, okay, why can't I find a deal? Month three to six, you're begging for deals. You can't find them. And then all of a sudden something pops. And then you've got two or three deals right in a row because you just start to recognize it. It's a cycle with these students that really you've got to watch and you've got to look out for, and you've got to be able to coach them through it because otherwise they'll get real frustrated. And, you know, they pay me a lot of money and if they don't feel they're getting their money's worth, I'll hear it. Um, so that's, you know, really the way the program works. It's really about keeping an eye on them as we go through it and keeping communications. We can set it up where I've got it set up where they're supposed to set up calls and stuff like that. But if I don't hear from somebody in three or four weeks, I need to be calling them. I don't have a ton of students. I'm a bottom up program. Okay. So bottom up means that we're ground floor. We're ground level coaching these people. We're not top down where we've got a module module online that says this is what you should be doing and this is how to do it keep watching online and you can get on a coaching call with 40 other people on friday we don't do that we're one-on-one -on -one. Uh, before i talk to you i'd spend an hour and a half with one of my students going over some stuff on how to find deals so that's the difference and you know i'm unique there's there's not many other programs like me I am franchised, so if I start seeing everybody doing this too, we're going to have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the real goal is franchising this to every city we can do that in so we can coach and teach people the right way how to do this because we want to give back. And, you know, John Fisher, I mean, I believe this beforehand, but John just instilled into the breakfast club this and into invest success and i live and breathe by this and as i go out there to sell franchises i'm living and breathing it still you know if you're not going to do it the way i want you to do it or the way it's designed then you probably should not be a franchisee so but guys like you that have been doing this for a long time and have been involved in the business you know if it weren't for you and joe and justin and travis and all that crew I mean, I'd be still sitting out here floundering as well because I get a lot of my info from you guys. I appreciate you saying that. We just really love what you guys are doing for our, I mean, we have a national audience here, but we're in Denver. You work in Denver. The franchise is national, yes, but the Invest Success, your students are local. What I love about what you're doing for our community, Tim, is that it's not some national guru. It's not through the CDN or pull up your MP3 player and listen to it and then go out and, and flail around. I mean, you really do handhold. You you take calls. I think they get your personal cell phone number when they they sign up with you. So that's pretty yeah. unique. You said they pay you a lot of money. I, I guess that's true, but it's relative because there's there's programs out there that are a hell of a lot more than what you uh, charge and they're not providing the same value. So kudos to you and what you're doing. Um, I love that uh, the Breakfast Club is still going strong and that you're getting business out of it. Sorry, I'm not going as often as maybe I should. You know, I got I got the kids and they're all in sports and mm -hmm. got um I got all of that that going on. But um, I just really appreciate what you're doing for the community. I wanted to share that with you. Thank you, thank you. And you know the what I tell people about breakfast love, it's always there. It's always going to be there, and we'll miss you for a little while. I'll give you a little grief if you show up <laughs> yeah. once every six years, but it's still there and. And the giving back of it is important. And one of the things I wanted to mention that that open forum part that we talk about really, I think is probably the most valuable thing that you can get out of it. We talk about the market and local real estate investors who are really in this business are ahead of the game. All right. We know what's going on. 
we were predicting, you know, this slowdown. We were talking about it for months and how to get prepared for it. Um, I wasn't around to, to forecast 2008, but I forecasted 2012, 13, 14, 15. I told everybody when the market would turn around because Denver's market is so seasonal that when we were started, it was a summer season. Nobody went to look at houses in the winter. It was horrible to look at houses in the winter. Right now, nobody wants to go looking at houses after June 15th because the summers are so amazing here. And so the market is really January through May. You know, so we're running into the kind of the slowdown period. Nobody's really talking about it. They'll start talking about it, you know, in a couple months. So maybe this is going to air in June or, or whenever. And um, we'll be in a slowdown because the summer slowdown hits hard. Um, last year, it hit June 16th. Did I know it was going to hit June 16th? No. Did I assume it was coming in July? Yeah. But June 16th, when the Fed raised interest rates considerably and everybody got scared. And that's the stuff that really is educational. And we talk about this consistently at Breakfast Club. What are we seeing here? What are we seeing nationally, too? Because that's a real big issue is where do you see things going on? You know, right now, I see a ton of money moving from California and New York which we all know that, but there's also a ton of move, money moving out of Denver to other places. Um, Denver's rental market is, is in a limbo land because there are a lot of people selling to an end buyer. So there's not going to be much affordable housing anymore. And we're going to see rental rates increase. So that's the type of stuff we talk about on a timely level. And I'm sure, you know, you're in Minnesota a lot. And I'm sure there's some stuff like that going on up there that I don't have. Yeah. It's worse. See, the seasonal stuff that you're talking about here is way worse in Minnesota than Colorado. People will do business in December and Colorado, not up there. <laughs> December, <laughs> January, February, forget it. Yeah. But each market's a little unique, yeah. Yeah, and those are the keys to our business as educators is we've got to, for those that come seek us out and want to know this information, you've got to be prepared with it. And it's not just, you know, doing something else all the time and then coming on a Saturday and putting this event together. I mean, people might look at me and think that's what's going on, but I'm sitting in my computer studying and learning all this stuff, talking to my students, researching properties every day. So I am up on this. You know, local government affairs are a huge thing right now. We, you know, Colorado, Denver, we didn't have that for a long time. It was status quo, but the last five years have totally switched. So now we've got to be on top of that. Um, you know, what's going to change in the next four or five years? I don't know yet. Um, you know, I know seven years from now, I'm going to be in an island somewhere, you know, <laughs> stuff with my ties and, and run a bar and you guys could come all hang out. But, you know. And we'll still talk real it. estate. And we'll still talk real estate. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I think. As an educator, it's not all about you. It's it's a lot about giving back to them, and then you'll get rewarded. That's what we're preaching here. For all the educators and influencers out there, if you're adding value and you really have that heart, then you're going to get business. Um, mm -hmm. I truly believe that. It's proven out in my life over and over, Tim's life as well, it sounds like. Um, Tim, I, I'm going to have to have you back, man, because we didn't even get into some of those stories, those horror stories with your property management and some of the stuff that you've seen with your students. So uh, I think we're about out of time here, but I, I want to have you back and go through some of that if you're willing. Absolutely. I'm always here. I always All like right, well, guys. I always like to hear, have people hear my voice too. So yeah. I'm always ready. <laughs> it's not you hearing your own voice. It's that you like to have them here. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Yes, <laughs> yes. I sound funny in my own head. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Let's talk about how people find out about the Breakfast Club, how they find out about Invest Success, and how they reach out to you if you're open to that. Cool. Yeah. So, invest-success.com. Um, all the info is right there. We just had a new website built. A uh, kid named Kate did an amazing job. Um, you go on there. There's a picture of me standing there answering questions. I'm. I, I guess I'm the little, the question guy that sits in the corner now. Um, but yeah, we'll answer questions. We'll tell you what's going on. Breakfast club is the second Saturday of the month. So it's, uh, breakfast club is the second Saturday of the month. So you need a ticket, 
their $30 and that money goes to paying the staff. We don't get any money out of that. Um, if you want to sign up for a year, you can. Uh, the classes are held every other Monday at a property being flipped. So you have to contact us to find out when that is and what's going on. You can call us direct off the website. You can have my cell phone, 303-517-9197. Uh, usually goes to voicemail and I'll call you right back. Just leave a message. Don't be a teenager that doesn't leave messages. Just tell me who you are. Uh, unlike my kids that don't leave messages anymore. <laughs> yeah. You you saw that I called. You know you what you that I want to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, Breakfast Club's a great way to do it. And you know, if you're out there thinking about how to help educate, you know, instead of building it all yourself, call me. We'll talk about a franchise because I've put it on a silver plate or silver platter for you and you take care of it. And you run with it and I guide you through it. And I guide you based on what's going on on your market. Because everybody, every market's different. And I don't know enough about every market to be an expert. Right. And right. that's one of the keys to this business is you got to find local experts and investor-friendly experts. Love it. Love it, Tim. Yeah, definitely going to have you back. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and sign off here. Is there any last pieces of wisdom or advice you want to share with our investor and our influencer crowd here? Yeah, give back. Go find those deals and and if the numbers work, go do a deal. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, Tim, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, Kevin. Be right, well. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did, please be sure to follow and leave us a review. Oh yeah, and tell a friend.